Good morning. Glad to have you with us again today. And it's it's great, awesome, and exciting. I want to mention up front that the next two weeks we're going to have a guest speaker here in Emmanuel, so we won't be posting online. So it'll be three weeks from now, we'll step back into Revelation. So I just want to mention that now. We are in the book of Revelation. And as I go through a book, one of the things that I want to do is always just kind of stop and look and, and, and assess and say, what does it mean? What does it mean for me as a believer? What does it mean for us? What's the importance of the book of Revelation? What is God trying to do as he speaks into your life and mine? So sometimes sometimes it's it's really helpful to just kind of step back and look at the big picture. That's what I want us to do today. I want us to look at Revelation again with a, with a simplicity and understand that that there is a simpleness to, to Revelation. You might say, you know what, as I think about Revelation, it's anything but simple. It's complex, it's full of symbols, it's full of all these things. I have a hard time under, understanding it. But I want to remind us what God is trying to do with the book of Revelation in your life and mine. What is it he wants to accomplish? What is it he wants us to see? That's the most important thing. As we walk through Revelation, we need to have a sense as to what that is. So today I want to do that. Uh, There's a singular focus that walks all the way through the book of Revelation. And that's what I want you and I to be reminded of, to catch, to reflect upon, to respond to from our life. And so today we're going to do that. We're going to take that opportunity. How do we, just a reminder, how do we understand the book of Revelation? How do we interpret? What's the the method of interpretation that we use that we draw from from, uh, the Word of God, what God intends for us to draw? We come to the Word of God uh, with with this, this set of priorities. One, we just simply take God's word at face value. Uh, we take each word at it in its literal sense, its plain sense. What, what is the English simply intended to communicate? What's the plain sense of the words and the meaning? What's the grammar teach us? Uh, the Greek in the Old Testament, the Hebrew, at times the Aramaic. What does it teach us? What does it show us? What's the context? What impact does that have on the, on the passage? What's the history around the, the book, the passage, the paragraph? What's, what's going on with the people? That's important to, to what happens. What's the author seeking to communicate to us? What's the intent of the author? What's the context, period? Context is king. Context has impact on everything that we draw from the Word of God. We never just draw from the Word of God a meaning in isolation. Uh, from what surrounds it, from, from other truth and content from the Word of God, it's really important. And so we come to the Word of God and we simply say, Lord, I believe what you have to say. He uses symbols, but he uses plain English and plain language as well. We interpret those symbols within the context of a passage of Scripture and understand that when symbols are used, they are intended by the author still and yet to convey uh, an important literal principle or truth for us. So so that's how we come to the book of Revelation. It impacts what we draw from Revelation and how we draw truth from Revelation, how we understand the truth that God is revealing to us. And so that's really important. This is the revelation uh, of Jesus Christ. We see Jesus Christ here in this book simply transforming history. His church, us, that's what it's all about. And so just in brief, we are reminded uh, there's three sections that come out of chapter 1, verse 17. John has seen uh, what's already taken place in chapter 1. That's Jesus Christ. He appears in all of his glory. He appears in his majesty. He appears um, in the very presence of his church. We see chapter 2, then John begins to write about things that are, things that are, that are taking place uh, as he writes, and that is the, uh, the letter of God through John to the seven churches and ultimately to us. It is us today. We are in this section called the things that are. This is the church age. This is a part of the church, chapters 2 and 3. And then chapter 4 to the end is where... Uh, so many conversations often come up. What's going to happen in the future? Things that things that will be. This is the breakdown of the book of Revelation. So what is what is the singular focus of the book? And what does that mean for you listening? What does it mean for me teaching, preaching, living, responding? What does it mean for us? Well, the focus of Jesus Christ is found in verse 1, chapter 1. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. And so what we see here is this. The book of Revelation is about Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation here, he he laid its content before us to reveal to God's people, to his people, to the family of God. It's for us who have faith in Jesus Christ. It's for us that we might know and understand what God intends to do through Christ. 
He's shown us two things in, in the book of Revelation. Number one, he shows us Jesus Christ. Number two, he shows us things that are going to take place. He doesn't answer all of our questions. There's a lot of unanswered questions that we all have. But he gives us a, a certainty. He gives us hope. Uh, he gives us, he answers the questions that matter for us to have a faithful, consistent walk grounded in faith. And so the book of Revelation here is about Jesus Christ. It's all about him. That's the singular focus that takes us all the way through all the content, all the prophecies, all the fulfillment, all the symbols, all those things. At the end of the day, it's about Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ becomes our number one priority. Revelation is intended to communicate to us, to you and I, as a child of God, that Jesus is to be our, our priority in our life. Galatians chapter 2, verse 10 reminds us, when we receive Jesus Christ anymore, it's not about us. It's about living for Jesus Christ. That becomes, that becomes the goal for every believer. Jesus impresses that upon the heart of every believer. Everything I do in my life, all of my loves, all of my hobbies, the friends that I choose, the things that I do, all those things then become a means to convey Jesus Christ in my life. Revealing Jesus Christ in my life. That's the most important thing. It is about Christ. My life is to be about Christ. I am to value Jesus so much that he is revealed in how I live my life, what I choose to do, why I choose to do it. That is to be the priority that he impresses upon the life of every believer. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Jesus is the head of the body, the church, that in everything he might be preeminent. The church is all believers in this age. If you have received Jesus Christ as Savior, you're part of his church. You're part of the family of God. It's not just, it's not a building. It, it, it's, it's, it's not a church building. It's, it's a community of believers. We are a part of a family, a family of God. We are part of the church. Jesus is the authority over that church. He's the head of that church. You and I, when we receive Jesus Christ and accept him as our Savior, we are saying, we are saying to him, Lord, you, you are the one that I will now follow with my life. You are the one that I will please in my life. You are the one who is important to me in my life. Everything else that I do, it is my desire to reveal that that priority in my life, Jesus Christ. That happens with power when we simply love Jesus Christ. When we love him with all of our heart, soul, and mind. That is the verse that we're laying across our hearts here in Emmanuel. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 27. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Everything that we do, you need to be, we need to be teaching our children, teaching our grandkids, uh, teaching one another that, that the, the motivation and the drive in our life is out of a love for Jesus Christ. Obedience is out of a love for Jesus Christ. And so I use what I love to reveal who I love even more. We love, a, we love many things in our life. We love to do this, and, and we love to participate in this, and, and, and these are passions in our life. But God intends that we use all of those things to reveal who it is that we love even more than those things, and that's Jesus Christ. Revelation is all about that. It's about the priority of Jesus Christ in your life. Does Jesus Christ have that kind of priority in your life? He's calling you. He's calling me to that. In chapter 1, you'll see I have these yellow blocks at the top. Those are chapters, okay? In chapter 1, verse 20, we see this. We see Jesus Christ standing in the middle of the seven churches. He's in the middle of his church. He had the candlesticks here. This isn't exactly what the candlesticks look like. This was just a good portrayal, a good picture. Um... But he's in the midst of the churches. The seven candlesticks there in that verse clearly represent the church. All of the churches of the church age. That's us included. That's you who belong to Jesus Christ. Now what do we see? Jesus Christ is always with us. He is there in the midst of his church. Whatever is about to unfold in the book of Revelation, it unfolds with this reality that Jesus is present with you, with his church. The seven churches that he wrote to, the local historical churches that he wrote to, us today, Jesus promises us, he reminds us, I'm with you. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. If you believe that and act upon that, that, that is power in your life every day. Do you believe that? 
right now with the, with the challenges that you face in your life, the adversity that might be in your life right now, uh, with the opportunities that you have before you, with, with the joys and the blessings that God has brought to you, um, do you believe that God is with you in every one of those moments, at every moment of every day, that God is with you? See, it's a, it's a, it's a walk of faith. When I believe that Jesus Christ is with me always, it changes how I encounter life. It changes how I respond to life. It changes how I view my life and what I'm doing. Revelation teaches us that. That's a principle that comes from this reality here in chapter 1, that Jesus is with us, He's with you. We also see in chapter 2 and verse 3, as, as John begins to write specifically to the seven churches, we see an empowered reality. Jesus says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The Spirit of God is always speaking to you. He takes the Word of God, He's speaking to you. He takes people of God and circumstances, He's speaking into your life. Right now, He's speaking to you. And so Jesus says, to the one who conquers, to the one who overcomes, I will. And then here in these two chapters, we have a series of promises that God gives to His church. We have in the Word of God a series of promises that God gives to us as we are faithful to Him and as we overcome in our life. But here's the reality. We don't do this by ourselves. He says, you need to be an overcomer. If you're a child of God, I call you, I expect you to be an overcomer in your life, to have victory over sin, to have victory over challenges. And you're like, wow, I, I, I can't do that myself. And you know what? You just gave the right answer because you can't do that yourself, and I can't either. It's Jesus Christ who enables us to do that. Jesus is our victory. The book of Revelation is about Jesus. I want you to be encouraged right now and today. You don't have to walk this walk of faith alone. You're not expected to win the victories by yourself. We are expected to walk in faith. We are expected to follow in obedience. But Jesus Christ is the one who enables. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24, He who calls you to salvation, he who calls you down the path of obedience, he who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Who's doing the work in your life? Who's bringing the power in your life? It's Jesus Christ. Believe Him. Trust Him. Hebrews 11 says, Without faith, it's impossible. Without faith, it is impossible. I can't take another step without faith. And then he adds to that, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. If I walk through life and I respond to life and I engage life and I engage people, but I don't do it by faith in Christ, it's impossible to please God in what I'm doing, how I'm engaging. Jesus says, without faith, it's impossible. When I, when I lack faith, I flounder. When I lack faith, I, I'm filled with doubt, with discouragement. When I lack faith, I go off kilter. I waver. Jesus Christ says, keep your eyes on me. I am the one who will enable you and empower. I want to encourage you this morning as you're studying Revelation, as it's touching your heart, Jesus Christ calls you to a high road but Jesus Christ has walked that road ahead of you he will enable you to do it because he is with you he is your savior he is your God Luke chapter 17 becomes our cry Lord increase our faith as the apostles and as the disciples said to Jesus when he when he challenged them to be forgivers when he challenged them with truth they said Lord we can't do that by ourselves. God, increase our faith. Lord, help us to believe you more. That's what prayer is. God, help me to believe you. Help me to do. Revelation teaches us that. We come to chapter 4, chapter 5. We see God the Father. We see God the Son, Creator, Redeemer, the one who, who paid our penalty, who gave his life for us on the cross. We see both of them there. And this is what we see. Chapters 4 and 5 set the stage for everything else that's going to come in the book of Revelation. And it's this, that God is worthy. And we see this about Jesus Christ. He is worthy of our life. Jesus Christ is worthy. He's worthy to do what he's about to do. He's worthy to fulfill the promises that God has given to us. He's, he's worthy to bring wrath upon sin. But he's worthy for your life and my life to be devoted to him. How important it is. Hebrews chapter 13. Through Christ, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. 
That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. How is praise sacrifice? Well, it's answered in this verse. The sacrifice of praise is confessing His name. The sacrifice of praise is acknowledging Jesus Christ in your life. If you're a teenager, if you're in college, if you're an adult at work, if you're a grandparent, every time that we acknowledge and confess Jesus Christ, every time we reveal biblical values in our life, every time our choices reflect biblical values and reflect the mind of Christ, the character of Christ, the priority of Christ on our life, every time we do that, there is a cost. Because there will be a response and there will be a pushback against those values, against that commitment of Jesus Christ, against the identity of Jesus Christ in your life. And every time that we do that in faith and continue forward in faith and make, make that commitment and, and, and stay faithful to Him, Jesus Christ is praised. And when Jesus Christ enables and when He allows and empowers you and I to, to take those steps of faith and gives us the strength, the wisdom to do that, then those become ways and means in which we praise God. And that's what chapters 4 and 5 are all about. It is God being praised for who He is. It is God being praised for what He's done. It is Jesus Christ being praised front and center for what He has done for us and who He is. See, here's the reality. Here, here in, in, uh, in chapters 5 and 6, Jesus takes the scroll. That's what He does. He takes the scroll. He's worthy to open the scroll. That's what we see. He's worthy to open the seals that are on the scroll. Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10. Worthy are you to take the scroll, to open its seals. For you were slain by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. They shall reign on the earth. That is Jesus Christ. Why is he worthy? Because he gave his life for you and I. That's right here in chapter 5. It teaches us that. How beautiful it is. This is all about Jesus Christ here in this chapter. What he has done for us. What he did for you. Do you know how, do you know how much he loves you? How worthy is he to take your place in mind? We're going to see that. And so he's worthy to open the seals. Well, what are those seals? What's taking place? Well, you know. You've been with us. If you haven't been with us, let us, let us show you what these seals are. Another thing that unfolds here in chapter 6, beginning verse 1, verse 8, is the, is the wrath of God begins. These are the six seals here in chapter 6. First is the tribulation begins. These seven years begin. Okay, When the rapture occurs, the tribulation is going to begin. And the, the six seals of God, the wrath of God, is going to begin upon earth. First, there's going to be a period of, of peace. It'll be a false peace. It won't be real. The Antichrist will come on the scene. He'll be challenged. Because of that, war, conflict, revolution, upheaval is going to take place. That's the second seal. Because of that, there's going to be, there's going to be famine. War always brings famine. This is now a judgment of God. The famine's going to be so intense. With a full day's bit wages, you can only buy food. Enough money for food, only food. There will be death. 25% of the world will die because of the judgment of God as a result of that fourth seal. The fifth seal, Christians are going to be slaughtered in the world. We've seen that. We took time here in chapter 6. We looked at that specifically. The world literally is going to be a shaken, a worldwide earthquake. The celestial bodies being impacted, being up, an upheaval in the skies and the heavens. All that is the beginning of the judgment of God, the wrath of God. Jesus is worthy to bring wrath against sin. That's what we see. He is worthy to bring wrath. As the judgment begins, the wrath of God is being poured out on us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake, God made Jesus, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. What is that telling us? Jesus willingly took our place on the cross. When he took your place, when he took my place on the cross, he stood between the wrath of God and your sin and my sin. He took God's full wrath. When he hung on the cross, he took the wrath of God for sin. The one who received the wrath of God, not because he was guilty, the word of God teaches us clearly that Jesus Christ was sinless, spotless, the Lamb of God. He became sin, not 
a sinner. He didn't become a sinner. He never sinned. He became sin. He took all the sin of all humanity, of all time, upon himself. And he became that sin. And it was that sin that the Father judged. And it was that sin that the wrath of God was poured out upon. Because that took place, he now stands as mediator between the Father and us. And he offers you and I an opportunity to have a relationship with God the Father. Why? Because he loved us. He loved us so much. He took the wrath of God. And when, that, and, and when the love of God is rejected, when the gospel message, when the truth of Jesus Christ, when that love that he displayed for us, when we reject that, when we turn away from that, then we deserve the wrath of God. And the wrath of God is now being poured out upon humanity here in Revelation. And so in chapter 6, as we come to the end of that chapter, the, the question that comes is that as the wrath has already begun is simply, is simply this. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? That's the question that takes us through the book of Revelation. Who can stand against the wrath of God? Well, we see the reality here is this. Jesus, He is righteous. He is right with God. He is holy. He is pure. He is spotless. He is the very Son of God. His righteousness separates Him from us. See, that's, that's the situation that we find ourselves in. We need a Savior. Ezra puts it this way. Behold, we as a people, Israel, we are before you, God. We're before you, God, in our guilt. For none can stand before you because of this. Ezra puts it beautifully right there. No one can stand before God because of sin. Jesus Christ is holy. He is righteous. God the Father is holy. He is righteous. God is holy. He is righteous. We can't stand before Him. We deserve the wrath of God. The wrath of God is being poured out here in Revelation because of the righteousness of God, because of the holiness of God. I want to show you here, we've mentioned this. This is so important to us. Remember, this Revelation is about Jesus Christ. There's one focus. It's Jesus Christ. All of Revelation teaches us that. The focus is Jesus Christ. But there are two twin themes that go all the way through the book of Revelation. And they merge together in one focus. That focus is Christ. What are those two themes that go all the way through the book of Revelation? Well, it is the wrath of God. It's the grace of God. It's the wrath, the grace of God. Jesus is our judge. Jesus is our deliverer. We see that here in the book of Revelation. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 how shall we escape, that is wrath, God's wrath, how shall we escape his wrath? How shall we escape if we neglect such a great, so great a salvation? You see, in that verse are two realities, God's wrath, God's deliverance. The salvation of God, deliverance of God. Jesus Christ is judge and deliverer. He sentences us. He has sentenced, he has sentenced humanity to judgment. And yet he frees us. He's our deliverer. We who are guilty are made right in Jesus Christ. It hinges upon us. What is our response to the love of Jesus Christ, to the gift of Jesus Christ? What is your response, your life's response to Christ going to be? Is it faith? Is it unbelief? Is it obedience? Is it disobedience? Is it his way? Is it my way? How we respond to Jesus Christ, His truth, His gift of life, will dictate whether we are recipients of God's wrath or whether we are recipients of God's grace. It is one, it is the other. There is no in between. I stand either as a recipient of God's grace or I stand as an object of God's wrath. That's the reality here. Who can stand before the holy, righteous judgment of God? It is Jesus Christ that we will stand before we will face. He answers that, chapter 7. We see 144,000 here. I believe this is, this is Israel. I think the Word of God is clear on that. And so we have Israel here being sealed for service. 12,000 from every tribe, every literal tribe of Israel, being sealed to serve God. Their goal, to, to evangelize, to witness. And what we see here is this. It is Jesus here. This is about Jesus, remember? These 144,000 are about Jesus. Revelation is about Jesus. This is what it teaches us, that Jesus turns our failure into success. Israel has failed miserably over and over again. 
They've had moments as a nation where they, they honored God. They walked with God. Uh, they worshiped God as they should. But as a nation as a whole, they, they didn't fulfill the great call that God gave to them. That was to be a, a, a witness to the nations, to be a light to the world, uh, to show the goodness of, of God to a world who needed a Savior. Israel failed to do that. They failed to show the world the goodness of God by obedience, by faithfulness to Him. They didn't do that. And then, and then ultimately they, they crucified Jesus Christ. They rejected Jesus Christ as Messiah. We were there as well. We are as guilty as Israel in rejection of Jesus Christ. There are many Christians even who teach that, that Israel has lost its place of, of blessing because of those past choices. But you know what? This is what Revelation teaches us. Revelation is the culmination of all things. It teaches us that God forgives. It teaches us that God is a God of grace. It teaches us that even though we might have scars in our life, and failures in our life, God heals. God forgives. God restores. God brings newness of life. These, these 144,000 Jews simply reinforces that, that life-changing reality that God is a God of grace. God changes. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if, if anyone... That's including a, a Jew here. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old has passed away, the new has come. That's your testimony. That's my testimony. That's our testimony. We are new people, made new in Jesus Christ. We have scars, we have failures. We still have failures in our life, but Jesus Christ has covered that in his blood. Jesus Christ has forgiven us. If we're a child of God, he continues to help us in our weakness. But we are sealed by his love. That's the beauty. Jesus Christ right now wants to take failure in your life and turn into success by walking with him. In chapter 7, we see this as well. Who can stand? Those who know Jesus Christ. Multitudes are saved from every nation. Jesus Christ is Savior. He saves Revelation teaches us that. Remember, the book. It's about Revelation. Your life is to be about Jesus Christ. My life is to be about Jesus Christ. He saves. So Hebrews chapter 7. Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives. He always lives to intercede for them. He always lives to bring them into a relationship with Jesus Christ, to stand between us and his Father to place his holiness into our life, his righteousness into our life, to make us new, so that we now have standing before God. That's privilege, folks. That's power. Uh, that's blessing. That's fellowship. That's community. That's communion. That's, that's good every day. That's what Revelation teaches you. Acts chapter 6, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. It's that simple. It's that simple. Last week, we were in chapter 8. We saw the reality of the trumpets, the wrath of God. They now begin to intensify. Chapter 8 begins with a time of silence in heaven, a time of silence for a half hour in heaven. The Lamb opened the seventh seal, and there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. That seventh seal opens up and reveals the seven trumpets. And so then we began to talk about those, those first of those trumpets, the first four trumpets. The trumpets are the judgment of God. God's wrath now continues from the seals to the trumpets. One third of the earth, of the trees, of the grass is burned up. One third of the seas turn into blood. One third of the sea life is destroyed. One third of all the ships in the world, economy, commerce, are destroyed. One third of fresh water is poisoned, bringing death. One third of the world's celestial light is impacted. It's lost. We looked at detail of what those mean. But you know what that is? That's ecological disaster. That's God's judgment on creation. And man is, is the recipient. Man is impacted. It is, it, is, it is every climate changes person's nightmare. It is ecological disaster. But it's not just nature acting. It's not just accidental. It's not just happenstance. It is God specifically at work through Jesus Christ. It is the hand of Christ. It is the work of Christ. 
He is delivering, releasing specific judgment against the earth because of sin. It is God's program, God's movement, moving a, a, a people who are his into the promised blessings of what he has given to us. It is God moving unbelievers to a place of judgment. It is God transforming history. Second Peter 3, 7. The heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. The heavens will be used as destruction against the ungodly. The heavens themselves will be burned up, we'll see, be created new again. James chapter 4, there's only one lawgiver. There's only one judge who is able to save and to destroy. To save and to destroy. Here we have Jesus Christ here. This is Jesus Christ. He's a lawgiver. He's the one, folks, he speaks truth into your life. When you receive Jesus Christ, you responded to the truth. Every day when you open the Word of God and make it a priority and the priority of your life, you are responding to His truth. He is the judge. It is His truth to which we will be accountable. Believer or unbeliever, I am still accountable to the truth of God's Word. Jesus is lawgiver. He is judge. He is truth. He is accountability. He is wrath. He is grace. He is able to save grace he's able to destroy wrath so the trumpet judgments are a reminder to us that jesus is calling you he's calling me the church is not here but it still teaches us it's instrumental in my life right now i need to hear heed the reality of what's taking place here in tribulation i must listen for it impacts me now it's about jesus in my life right now today the trumpets always in the scripture are means of God getting our attention. How is God getting your attention? What is God doing right now to get your attention? What is he using in your life? What is he using around your life? Who is he using? What kind of circumstances? What is God doing to get your attention? That's what the trumpets here are all about. Is God is bringing these trumpet judgments down upon the earth. He's saying you have one, literally, literally, he is saying you have one last chance to respond to me. What if God said to you and I, you have one last chance to respond to me? The trumpets were always a means of God getting our attention. We saw that last week. Isaiah 55 reminds us here, we're to seek the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Jesus is calling you. He's calling you to, to, to salvation. He's calling you to be faithful to him. He's calling you to love him to embrace Him. He's calling you to walk faithfully before Him. What is your response going to be? Even to the believer, He is speaking truth into our life. He is calling us to be faithful, to make good choices, to be obedient to Him. He sends warnings to us and to our life so that we might be faithful to Him. We will not ultimately receive the judgment of God, but we will be accountable to God. Trumpets remind us that Jesus is calling into our life. He's trying to get our attention. Joel chapter 2 reminds us that God is a God of grace and mercy. Yet even now, declares the Lord, as he's now speaking to Israel, if he's speaking to us, he would be inviting us, return to me with all your heart, or you and I come to me with all your heart. Rend not your hearts, rend not your hearts, but rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. He is gracious he is merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He relents over disaster. He says to you and I, don't make changes on the outside. Let Jesus Christ touch your heart on the inside. You let him touch your heart. Say, Lord, increase my faith. Lord, touch my heart. Lord, show me who you are. Lord, remind me of your love for me. Lord, remind me that you have given me everything that I need today for my life that I will walk and for godliness so that I will please you, 2 Peter 1, 3. God, you have everything for me that I need today. Respond to that by walking in faith, in obedience. Say, God, today, my life, what I do today, it, it's going to be about you. It's not going to be about me. It's going to be about you. He says to us, come to me with all your heart. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your strength, all your soul, and all your mind. Don't, don't deal on the outside. Deal on the inside. Repent, confess, change, yield, respond on the inside. The outside will come. The outside changes because the inside is transformed. Let God touch your heart. This is good news. This is the gospel. You and I are guilty. We deserve wrath. We deserve the judgment of God. I received Jesus Christ as my Savior when I was a young boy. I'm still growing. I'm still learning. I still mess up. But I am a child of God. I will not receive the wrath of God. That is God's grace. I deserve it. I will not receive it because of my faith in Jesus Christ, because of what he did for me on the cross. That can be you as well. May you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Come to him and say, Lord, I come to you. I give you my heart. The stuff in my life, those are all the outward things. The people, the relationships, the circumstances, the habits, the challenges, those are all, those are all out there. God, touch my heart. I give you my heart. I put my faith in you. It's you are the one who can make me new. You are the one who forgives me and, and washes me. Like the 144,000 Jews, they represent the grace of God to Israel. When we are saved, God's grace is poured into your life and he makes your life new. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, respond by faith to Christ and ask him to do in your life what only he can do to forgive, to wash, to cleanse, to make you new. With your heart, make this commitment to the Lord. Lord, I, to you I will follow. To you I will be true. It will be your way in my life, not mine. I will seek you. I will follow after you. I will learn from you, learn about you. Lord, teach me to love you because of what you've done for me. I'm a child of God. I need to embrace my relationship with Jesus Christ every day. I need to love him passionately, to follow him, to obey him. Revelation is simple. It's quite complex in what it shows us. But beneath those complexities is the, is the simplicity of Jesus Christ. Is Jesus Christ yours? And are you following him? Are you encouraged today because of what Jesus Christ is doing in your life? Are you encouraged by knowing what he can do in your life? Let your faith grow. Jesus, increase my faith. He will honor that. Thank you for joining with us. As I said, it'll be three Sundays we'll meet back together. Pick back up in the book of Revelation. I'm looking forward to that. May the Lord bless you, use you, touch your heart. Pray, enjoy your Mother's Day today, your time together as family. May the Lord bless you, and we'll see you next time.